starts now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Cash Matlock. This was the scene around 8.30 this morning in Columbus. A truck and an ambulance were traveling in opposite directions on North 5th Street when they crashed into each other near the Fitness Factor Gym. There was only one person in the truck, but it's unclear how many people were in the ambulance. It's unknown at this time if there were any injuries in this accident. We have asked the Columbus Police Department for more information, and we will have those details as soon as they become available. A Starkville teen is behind bars tonight. The 13-year-old was arrested Friday for a grand larceny motor vehicle. The vehicle was reportedly stolen from Northside Drive Friday morning. The juvenile is being processed in youth court. If you have any information regarding this incident, please contact the Starkville Police Department or the Golden Triangle Crime Stoppers. Well, in national news, five people are dead after a plane crash near a post office in Lafayette, Louisiana, on Saturday. Now, according to authorities, New Orleans, uh, according to authorities, New Orleans television station WDSU said one of their sports reporters, Carly McCord, died in that crash. The Lafayette Fire Department identified the other victims as pilot Ian Biggs, Robert Von Crisp II, Gretchen D. Vincent, and Michael Walker Vincent. Now, McCord's husband, Stephen Ensminger Jr., the son of the offensive coordinator for the Louisiana State University football team, told the Associated Press she was riding in a private plane from the Lafayette or from Lafayette to the Peach Bowl in Atlanta with friends to watch LSU play Oklahoma. Now, McCord, who was 30 years old, was the daughter-in-law of LSU offensive coordinator Steve Ensminger, according to WDSU in a statement. The station said they are, quote, devastated, devastated by the loss of such an amazing talent and valued member of our WDSU family, end quote. Lafayette Fire Chief Robert Benoit said the aircraft was an eight-passenger plane. CBS affiliate KLFY reports two people suffered serious injuries. We're going to have more on sports reporter Carly McCord coming up later in sports. We have seen a few scattered showers throughout the day today. Looks like perhaps a light shower passing through Columbus right now with some reduced visibilities. It's a very warm and humid night here. Temperatures still in the mid 60s in most spots. Some showers being reported in Starkville with winds out of the south and east area wide between 5 and 15 miles an hour. Now, while winds will continue to increase, we'll also likely see some more showers into the overnight hours. That is ahead of this next system sliding our way here. We're seeing some severe weather into central Arkansas. We have the chance for some strong to severe storms in our area heading into tomorrow. I've got more details on that coming up in just a bit. Thanks, Jacob. Well, New Year's Eve is right around the corner, and for many people, that means fireworks. It's a big business this time of year, but do those what do those business owners do after January 1st? WCBI's Tyler Hole has more on the story. At least twice a year, they light up the night sky. For many families, fireworks are part of the holiday celebration. And even though it may seem the fireworks stands appear overnight, the tents are set up in specific locations and run by specific people. Behind the scenes for holidays like the 4th of July and New Year's are the vendors who sell fireworks. The Ray family has been in this business for years. They work for Orbit Fireworks. They see the time to work with the fireworks as a vacation. I'm always working. Uh, I own a mobile home uh, remodeling company and that's all we do seven days a week. Chris Ray runs the tent in Macon, sitting on the hill. He has been in that same spot for 14 years, and he says that it's just fun. I love it. If I could do it every day for the rest of my life, I would do it. It's, it's a lot of fun. You get to meet a lot of people. Um, you know, it's like camping with out being in the woods. You know, you get to sit out here, hang out, uh, meet a lot of nice folks, man. Get to talk to everybody. And so it's a lot of fun. Ray's son, Killian, who operates the tent in West Point, runs through the process of getting everything set up. We uh, get here, they've already got the tent set up and all the posts dug and then we, they bring us that trailer full of all the stuff that we had left over from last season. They just put it in dry storage and then uh, we start off with that and then they just bring us more. Chris Ray has one more message for everybody who will be enjoying fireworks. Be safe. Shoot fireworks responsibly. Tyler Hall, WCBI News. Well, Orbit Fireworks has many locations throughout Mississippi and Alabama, including four in the Golden Triangle. And once again, 2020, right around the corner, and it may seem like the perfect time for a fresh start at the gym. However, according to research conducted by Strava, the social network for athletes, they discovered that Saturday, January 12th, is actually the day that New Year's resolutions meet their fate 
with failure. Our DeAndrea Turner has more on the story. The main focus that you should have on a New Year's resolution is consistency and not perfection. As one year ends and a new one begins, personal trainer Allison Webster counsels clients and newcomers to the gym on reaching their fitness goal. She says her best advice, take it day by day. Just be really consistent with your goals and try every day mindfully to include healthy eating and exercise. While learning consistency, also set small goals. Micro goals could include things like drinking, say, six to eight glasses of water every day. And to know that getting in shape is a process. Don't, you don't gain the weight overnight, so you're not going to lose the weight and get fit overnight. Uh, so it should absolutely be a, a habitual lifestyle change. To keep those New Year's resolutions intact, Webster suggests that you pick an environment or a community to work out with that you enjoy. Like Chris Carson, who enjoys group fitness. Uh, the, the pack mentality, I think, really helps people stay motivated. And the great thing about this year is we're not just a bunch of friends, but it's one huge factor family. And everybody kind of cheers each other on and, and encourages each other and pushes us to do better. One woman a part of his pack is Amy Boge, who started her New Year's goal to be fit almost a decade ago. When I had my first child, he's about to turn nine, and I just made a resolution with myself. I want to make it a lifestyle, not just a year-by-year -year thing. She says maintaining her lifestyle is about more than just her. I think that I need to have a good example and be a good example for my children and so that they understand what healthy choices are and lifestyle of exercise. And remember, consistency over perfection is always going to get you to that big goal first. Webster also suggests to write out goals on a calendar. Coming up, an astronaut breaks the record for the longest time spent in space for a female. Her story after the break. Stay with us. You're watching WCBI News at 10 p.m. with Cash Matlock. This was the scene back in March in Kazakhstan. A rocket carrying two American astronauts and a Russian cosmonaut blasted off for the six-hour flight to the International Space Station. Today, 289 days later, just one of them remains in space. And tonight, she's setting a space milestone. Christina Cook now holds the record for the longest single space flight by a woman. But her space odyssey is about much more than just the duration of her time away from Earth. Christina Cook was greeted with hugs when she arrived at the International Space Station eight and a half months ago, realizing a dream she'd had since childhood. The 40-year-old engineer was originally supposed to spend six months in space, but in April, her stay was extended to last nearly a year. And today, she breaks the record held by retired astronaut Peggy Whitson for the longest single trip in space by a woman. It's a huge honor. Peggy is a heroine of mine who's also been kind enough to mentor me through the years. And so it's a reminder to give back and to mentor when I get back. Part of Cook's mission is to study the effects of long-term space travel on the human body. Well, I also like to think of it as it's not so, many, so much how many days you're up here, but what you do with each of those days. So that reminds me to bring my best to every single day. I think it's wonderful for science. It helps us push the boundaries of what we know about what long duration spaceflight can do to the human body, and that's important for our future exploration deeper into going to Mars and also returning to the moon and going there to stay. Since her mission began, Cook has completed four spacewalks, including one that was history making in its own right. I'm right beneath your feet, so don't move down. In October, she and fellow astronaut Jessica Meir conducted the first all female spacewalk snapping selfies as they swapped out faulty batteries on the International Space Station and following it up with a phone call from President Trump. I just want to congratulate you. What you do is incredible. It's so, you're very brave people. I don't think I want to do it. I must tell you that. Cook discussed that milestone with us yesterday on CBS This Morning. Why do you think we're seeing these milestones now for women in space? You know, I think it's a wonderful time for human spaceflight because I think we finally recognize that it's not worth going unless we go together, that it's important to not turn away any innovative idea, that everyone has a role and everyone has a place at the table as we move forward. If we're going to go for all humanity and to support humanity's love for exploration, then we have to do it with all humanity. And I think we're seeing that as our plans unfold for going back to the moon, seeing the first woman walk on the moon in 2024, and just recognize 
recognizing that we have to go together if we're going to go and we're going to do it right. While she's not on Earth, Cook has kept her eye on home, sharing photos of our planet with her 145,000 Twitter followers. Most recently, a picture of Mount Everest. I would say the most awe-inspiring thing that I've ever seen is the northern lights or southern lights or auroras, we call them, from above on a planetary scale. I've had the opportunity working in Antarctica and the Arctic to see them from below and the beautiful shimmering lights along the sky and taking over the whole sky. But to look down on the Earth and see the entire shape of the auroras, you know, as they form near the poles was truly an amazing sight and just literally took my breath away. Being away for so long has required sacrifice, including spending holidays away from family while suspended in zero gravity. Still, Cook says she hopes her record doesn't last long. My number one hope for this milestone is that the record is exceeded again as soon as possible because that means that we're continuing to push the boundaries. There will be showers and thunderstorms tomorrow area-wide at some point during the day. However, some of them may very well be on the strong to severe side as our cold front comes on in. Coming up after the break, we'll talk more about the threats, the timing, and I'll have a full look at your seven-day forecast. Stay right here. Your WCBI First Alert AccuWeather Forecast with meteorologist Jacob Dickey. We continue to see scattered showers in the area this evening. That will continue overnight tonight. It also still is warm, muggy, and cloudy out there in most spots. 66 the temperature in West Point, 61 with some light drizzle in Starkville. As of the latest report, other areas continue to see showers with south and east winds between 5 and 15 miles an hour. Heading into tonight, there will be some scattered showers continuing out there, perhaps a rumble of thunder, but I'm not really concerned about things. Only dropping down into the low 60s, 62 in Starkville, 63 in Columbus, Vernon at 62. I've got a low of 65 in Tupelo. Tomorrow is when we get our chance for scattered showers and thunderstorms into the region. South winds will be between 10 and 30 miles an hour during the day. And temperatures will climb into the upper 60s, even low 70s ahead of that cold front. A little cooler to the west where showers and storms move in earlier. A little later timing of the front and the storms means low 70s to the east there. 71 in Columbus and in West Point, 67 in Oxford and in Coffeyville. Now the chance for showers and storms tomorrow does come with a severe threat. We are advertising officially a level one threat tomorrow from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. Though I would not be surprised if this is up to a level two threat by tomorrow. Main concern will be for straight line damaging winds in excess of 50 miles an hour. Could damage some trees and cause some small localized power outages. The tornado threat is low but not zero. I just can't rule out a tornado somewhere into the region. Maybe one or two of those. And then we likely will see some heavy rain in spots with that. Here's what Futurecast has overnight tonight. Some scattered showers passing on through. No concerns here. Watch as our cold front approaches then after 7 a.m. We could get a quick little round of some stronger storms in the far northwest parts of our area from Grenada to New Albany and to the north and west. Then into the early afternoon, we see more showers and storms along that cold front and then even some development ahead of it. This is where I think our better chance for severe weather will come into Sunday afternoon, perhaps lasting into the evening until we can get that cold front out into central Alabama. Now, one of the things we've been watching is the energy and instability in the atmosphere here. We have lots of wind energy. The question was, though, on storm energy. This is like fuel in the atmosphere for storms. Notice some of these darker green values carrying to the north here. We think that may be the case, in fact, with a later timing, and that would mean perhaps a more robust event for showers and storms and even bring that severe threat up a little bit. There also is plenty of wind energy in play here, so something worth monitoring. Of course, download the WCBI mobile app. We'll send you a push alert if an alert is issued in your area. We also have the forecast updates available there 24-7 as well as on our website. So it looks like it's going to be kind of a clear night to see those fireworks then. Huh? Yes, the good news is if we get past this event here, Monday, Tuesday, lots yeah. of sunshine, just a little cooler, yeah. mid-50s. Okay. For where we've been, that's a bit uh, chilly yeah. sounding, but actually that's about our average temperatures for this time of year. Yeah. More showers in the next week. And then we were talking earlier about how it's kind of good that the ground's going to get wet before all those... Yeah, Fireworks we've had a off. really, really <laughs> wet year here. In fact, this likely yeah. will be uh, one of the top 10 re wettest record years wow. for our region. So we'll have okay. updates on that before the end of the year. All right. Well, thank you, Jacob. Well, just a few more days until Mississippi State plays its final game of the season in Nashville. Courtney has more on the Music City Bowl when we come back. Your WCBI Sports with Courtney Robb. 
All season long, Mississippi State has been riding the quarterback roller coaster. So, how could we expect anything different for the season finale, also known as the Music City Bowl? In case you missed it, the news announced on Thursday that freshman quarterback Garrett Schrader is out, while senior quarterback Tommy Stevens is in. Head coach Jim Moorhead saying the last minute switch up is due to an upper body injury that Schrader sustained in practice. Moorhead also saying that the good news is the Bulldogs have been through this situation before. We're experts at it this year, so we, we've, we've done it a time or two. We played the shuffle, but yeah, I mean, Tommy's an experienced guy. Uh, you know, when he's been healthy, he's performed very well, so Tommy will be the number one, and uh, he'll go in and operate the offense and, you know, make plays with his arm and his feet, and I know the guys have a ton of confidence in him. I like to take pride, at least, you know, from every opportunity that I did have to start. I mean, I'm talking like way back, even my retro freshman year at Penn State, I always took it as I was a starter and continue to do the same things here, even, you know, when I was a starter, when I haven't been a starter. So um, there have been no changes as far as how I've, how I've prepared. The Music City Bowl between Mississippi State and Louisville will take place this upcoming Monday, December 30th. Mark your calendars. If you're looking to watch the bowl game, you can catch all the action over on ESPN. Kickoff is at 3 p.m. We'll also have live coverage from Nashville starting tomorrow on Sunday night right here on WCBI. A new decade begins in just a few days. And while the year 2020 brings a fresh start, it also welcomes reflection of the past. It's hard to reflect on the past 10 years of collegiate baseball, especially at state, without talking about former outfielder Jake Mangum. D1Baseball.com agrees. Mangum recently tapped D1 Baseball's all-decade squad. Honestly, how could he not be? During his time as a Diamond Dog, Mangum appeared in four Super Regionals, back-to-back -back College World Series, and became the SEC's all-time hits leader with a grand total of 338 or 38. Oh, excuse me, 383 hits in his career, rather. Uh, the Mississippi State native also earning the Ferris Trophy, awarded to the best collegiate player in the state. It's safe to say that Mangum has solidified himself in Diamond Dog history before he was drafted by the New York Mets in June of 2019. Some scores from today, Ole Miss women's basketball. Closing out its non-conference schedule this afternoon, play nose to Alabama State inside the pavilion. The Rebels coming away with a big 93 to 66 victory. The Rebels improved to a 7 and 6 overall record on the season. Ole Miss will begin SEC play in the new year starting January 2nd against Georgia. That game will be at 6:45 p.m. First-ranked LSU taking on fourth-ranked Oklahoma this afternoon in the college football playoff semifinal. Find out who's headed to New Orleans when we come back. Sports coverage of the Music City Bowl is brought to you by OCH Regional Hospital and the Columbus Convention and Visitors Bureau. Today, the first-ranked LSU Tigers and the fourth-ranked Oklahoma Sooners faced off in the college football playoff semifinal. Just ahead of the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, LSU offensive coordinator Steve Ensminger and the Tiger community hit with tragic news. One of the five killed in a plane crash in Lafayette, Louisiana, was Ensminger's daughter-in-law, sports reporter Carly McCord. McCord was just 30 years old and was traveling to Atlanta for the matchup between the Sooners and the Tigers. LSU head coach Ed Ogeron reportedly delivered the news of the tragedy to his offensive coordinator. Ogeron saying before the game that there was no doubt that despite the news, Esminger would continue to coach in the college football playoff this afternoon. And coach Ensminger did. Let's get to the game. LSU and Heisman winner Joe Burrow facing off against Oklahoma in the college football semifinal. First quarter, no score. LSU quarterback Joe Burrow finding wide receiver Justin Jefferson and fighting his way in for a 19-yard touchdown. The Tigers take a 7-0 lead. A few plays later, running back Kennedy Brooks fighting his way into the end zone as well. Gets in there for the three-yard carry. It's all knotted up at 7. Under 5 to go. Burrow to wide receiver Terrence Marshall, Jr., an eight-yard touchdown. LSU takes the 14-7 lead. A minute to go in the first. Burrow back to pass. Throws. Finds Jefferson for a 35-yard touchdown. The Tigers now up 21-7. Second quarter. Burrow again to Jefferson. This time, 
A 42 yard pickup in the touchdown. So LSU rolling 28 to 7 and 12 to go in the half. Quarterback Jalen Hurts goes for the flea flicker, throws deep. Picked off though by quarterback Kerry Vincent Jr. Nice interception there for the Tigers. And then right before the break, Burrow finds Jefferson again. A 30 yard touchdown, his fourth. Of the game, another dominating performance for Joe Burrow and company. LSU tops Oklahoma with a final of 63 to 28. Wow, 493 yards, eight touchdowns for Burrow this afternoon. LSU advances to the national championship in New Orleans. That's it for sports. We'll have more for you when we come back. Stay with us. Well, this baby Yoda cat is looking for a forever home. This rescue is in North Carolina and is getting a lot of attention for her resemblance to Baby Yoda, a character from the Disney Plus Star Wars series The Mandalorian. It's been used in a lot of social media memes lately. Joy was found by a Rowan County Humane Society volunteer on December 15th with a large neck wound, but vets do not believe that it was caused by a lightsaber battle. Instead, it was likely the result of an animal attack or an accident. Joy is thought to be one or two years old, and she's very affectionate. A little cat there, kind of grumpy cat. Then Joy, of course. <laughs> uh, we've got our seven-day forecast here. We're watching for some showers and storms. Of course, tomorrow, those full updates are on your WCBI mobile app. That's a great way to stay connected and get the first alert if something is issued in your area. Good news, sunshine, Monday and on Tuesday. Definitely looking forward to a clear New Year's night. Be nice. Yeah, it will be. Gotcha. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. See you back here tomorrow.